I love chocolate. I go, I love to read, so I go to the library, I pay my book, and there in front of me are all of these chocolates. And I ha wasn't thinking of chocolate, but the chocolates there are speaking to my brain, activating the dopamine system, and before I know it, I buy the chocolate. But I didn't want to buy it, I didn't want to eat it. And it's exactly the same process with drug addiction. People get conditioned to places where they've taken the drugs, to people whom they've taken the drug, and when they go into those environments, they immediately desire the, the drug. It's an automatic reaction. It's not something that they say, I'm going, I, I, I want to take the drug. It happens. Our brain is hardwired to want to know. And, and science, you get paid to think. They get, you get paid to discover things. I mean, so how better can it get? So when, when people say, well, science is boring, I just, the person that is presenting the science is boring is not the science that is boring, because science is fascinating. It's the ability to comprehend our universe. And ultimately, to me, the greatest challenge is the ability to understand how the human brain works. I was born in Mexico, I went to Mexico, uh, to the school, medical school in Mexico. And in Mexico, it's six years of medicine. So when I was finishing, there was a paper on Scientific American that spoke about positron emission tomography as an imaging device that allow you to look at the function of the human brain, and that completely captivated my imagination, absolutely. I convinced my father to subsidize me to go to New York, and I showed up at New York University and I said, I read this article, I think it's fascinating, I want to volunteer to work on it. I'm particularly intrigued about the concept about how do we exert control what motivates and drives our behavior, and why people lose that capacity. When did I first become interested in science? It's hard to trace because I've been an incredibly curious person. So as a child, I would always try to understand what made things work or why the animals did some things and how did we differ from one another and what made our personalities. And also my father is a scientist, he's a chemist. I would get into his uh, laboratory and play with his chemicals. And I was a child and my father would get furious because we were not supposed to do that, uh, me and my sisters. We were growing in, in the house where Trotsky was killed. And, and to me, there was, if you're a child, and I knew he was buried there, there was a le level of mystery and also of fear to get just actually into the room where he had been assassinated because all of the objects were there. You could see where the bullets had hit the, the walls in a previous attempt by Diego Rivera. No, it wasn't Diego Rivera, it was Siqueiros. So the notion that my family had been exterminated because of a belief, because of a belief of, of creating an, um, a society where you are giving chances to everybody, where people are allowed to develop. So, I was brought up with a very strong sense of responsibility with your life to do something that will help others as opposed to responsibility of your life, just to enjoy your life on itself. If you look at uh, the way that society deals with psychiatric patients, it's basically with a lot of disrespect and lack of consideration. And in fact, until very recently, and it's still the case, in certainly in many countries, you cannot get reimbursed from insurance if you have a psychiatric disease. Addictions, drug abuse, are actually the ones that are the most, most stigmatized. So w where you are at is a disease of the brain that produces a loss of your ability to exert control, what we call free will, because free will is not something that's spontaneous, I sort. It's the product of the biology of the brain and there are certain networks and circuits that enable you to do it. Drugs disrupt those specific circuits, and as a result of that, even though you are aware that you shouldn't be taking drugs, you cannot stop it. My favorite uncle was an alcoholic, and, and, and I was fascinated by him. He was a very extremely generous man. Um, he, he was wonderful. He, and yet, when he drank, it was like, another person and at the same time I realized how much that drinking behavior was pushing him into depression and isolation 
because there is this total rejection against the person that's addicted, as opposed to recognizing that that individual is suffering from a disease of the brain, which is disrupting the control. So a person that is addicted because of the stigma is not going to come up and say, you know, I'm an addict, I need help. Most people don't. There are some that are very courageous and do it, but most people don't. And the same thing with the families. Families are very, very scared, very, very shamed about having someone in their family that was addicted. The, the father of my mother was an alcoholic, and, and my, my mother really didn't tell me anything into, of this until she, one year before she died, she told me, Nora, you know, I never told you this, but my father was an alcoholic and he committed suicide because he could not control the alcohol drinking. This is my mother. I have a very good relationship close to her. Her daughter is studying drug addiction and she did not dare to tell me that her father had been an alcoholic and had committed suicide. And she didn't do it because of the shame of the fear that I would not have the respect or admiration for my grandfather, which of course for me was nonsense, but it really exemplifies how close, how much of a secret drug addiction is still among family members and also on, on the people that are addicted to drugs. They don't want others to know that they have a problem. Or, and in many instances, the person that's addicted doesn't even acknowledge that there is a problem. My father wanted to have boys and he had four girls. So he really trained us as if we were boys in terms of what he expected us from us, both in sports and in science. Then as you go into professional world, then you start to see the distinctions that are made um, sometimes between men and women. But, but it's changing and I, and I think as, as women and more and more women are getting into science, there, I would hope that one day that will be something that is not even an issue. And that's why actually for many years I was reluctant. People say, well, you're the first female this scientist to do that. And I, I, I always oppose that term of you're the first female scientist. I'm a scientist. And now, now I'm, I'm not so sensitized because what I've come to recognize is that a lot of women still are afraid and the ability to be seen as a role model for women is actually something that can help them. And without, for example, doing it on purpose, I ended up at my own laboratory having the largest group of neuroscientists that are females in the country. Now I'm more sensitive to that and I'm much, I'm much more willing to say, yes, I am a woman scientist. But I am a scientist, not just woman scientist. Mm -hmm.